last one. It was the speaker's balcony, like, all the way there. Oh, right. oh okay. Facing the south, facing the south. Actually, yeah. facing out towards the back. Facing the back. Oh, oh, south. Oh, yeah, I got you right. Yeah, that would have been tricky. Okay, you don't need this. Can look that way or that. And all the flag thing. Come on. Not that Trump looked that great in the Oval either. Four, four lights. Four. Two were bounced okay. off the ceiling because you guys lit it, Mary. Did you shoot the uh, I, Yeah, I, I did Jonathan's camera. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. So, yeah, two bounced off the ceiling and the other two. Jumping. And in 6 dB. And the guys were over an hour, hour late to get in there to preset. Who shot it? Danny O'Shea. Yeah. And then... Uh, while they're setting up, Trump came back in and sat in there it was like Perfect. while they were setting up. <laughs> but it was really weird, they said. Cool. A little awkward. <laughs> Interesting assignment, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> A little different. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the inaugural press conference that will be held on a weekly basis by our Vice Chair Catherine Clark and myself. Today we're pleased to be joined by two very distinguished members of our dynamic freshman class who you'll be hearing from uh, momentarily. We had a very uh, active discussion in today's caucus meeting uh, focused largely on two things. First, on the continuing effort by House Democrats to end the reckless Trump shutdown. 
We also are continuing to move forward with our affirmative, forward-looking agenda to deal with kitchen table, pocketbook issues connected with our For the People agenda. We had a very robust discussion during the months leading up to the November midterms about what we would do to make life better for everyday Americans focused on lowering health care costs, protecting people with pre-existing conditions, strengthening the Affordable Care Act, a robust bipartisan infrastructure program, and cleaning up corruption here in Washington, D.C. We continue to focus on those things as we deal with this reckless Trump shutdown. This is day 19 of a Donald Trump-inspired shutdown that is solely the result of a presidential temper tantrum because of the president's inability to extract five plus billion dollars for a medieval border wall. No one outside of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue thinks that this border wall is in any way effective in terms of dealing with improving border security on our southern border. Democrats have consistently indicated that we are willing to substantially increase funding for border security that takes the form of enhanced technology, drones, satellites, cell phone towers, reinforcing, reinforcing existing fencing and barriers that currently are in existence. But we are not willing to waste taxpayer dollars on a medieval border wall that is a fifth century solution to a 21st century problem. And we are certainly not willing to reward a presidential temper tantrum that has shut down the government for 19 days. Because real Americans are being impacted. Tax refunds are delayed. Farm subsidies and assistance delayed. Mortgage loans delayed. Small business loans delayed. Food assistance to individuals throughout this country who are food insecure, including millions of children delayed. And that's why we as Democrats have simply said to Mitch McConnell and the boys over in the Senate, take yes for an answer. We are passing bills that they have previously passed and signed off on in the Senate in a bipartisan way. And later on today, we will begin that process again by bringing to the floor and passing a bill to reopen the Department of Treasury and the Internal Revenue Service to ensure, despite the presidential rhetoric, that millions of Americans can receive the tax refunds that they rely upon and we'll proceed from there. Let me now yield to our distinguished Vice Chair of the House Democratic Caucus, the gentlelady uh, from the Commonwealth, did I get that right? You did. Commonwealth <laughs> of Massachusetts, Catherine Clark. Thank you, Hakeem, for your leadership. Uh, we are very pleased to be here uh, for the first press conference of this new caucus. And uh, today I want to talk about what is on the minds of my constituents and Americans, and that is ending this shutdown. Let me be clear. The top priority for Democrats is to end this shutdown and put our federal workers back to work with the full pay that they deserve. It's what's fair and it's what's necessary. We're seeing stories coming in about TSA workers who are selling their own plasma to, because they are worried about bills. In Boston, on the Coast Guard base, we have had the community open a food pantry to enable young families who live paycheck to paycheck to be able to afford food and feed their families during this shutdown. We are asking the very people who secure our borders to work without pay. And what is it for? It is for a political slogan that has turned into a $5.7 billion bill to the American taxpayer. Democrats and this caucus are very serious about border security. But as Hakeem said, 
We want to do it in a smart way. Let's use our, our best technology. Let's look at what the real issue is, which we've heard from federal researchers in my district, tunneling is one of the threats. We know that drugs come across our southern border, but most of those come through the ports. Let's secure them. Let's have more personnel. Let's shore up the fencing and other barriers that we already have if that's necessary. But there is no data, there is no proof that this is anything but a campaign promise, campaign rhetoric, a great line at campaign rallies for this president that he is now using as ransom and holding our federal employees and their families and our economy as hostages. We all want to see an end to this, and we want to be able to address the true crisis at the border, which is one which this president and this administration created, and that's the humanitarian crisis with refugees and the families that we see coming. So our message from our caucus is clear. We need to end the shutdown. As Hakeem said, we want the Senate to take yes for an answer. We will continue to pass the bills that the Senate wrote. These are Republican bills that they have already approved and take yes for an answer. Um, we, uh, we know uh, that we want to keep Americans safe. And we know that there are smart ways to do that. But this wall is not an answer. And we can no longer allow our federal employees and their families and that economic ripple uh, that goes through our economy to be held hostage by this president. And I am very pleased um, to introduce uh, one of our new members of Congress, uh, Xochitl Torres Small from New Mexico. She represents the southern part of New Mexico with almost 200 miles of, of border. And she knows firsthand the, the type of thing that we need to be doing to secure that border, like making sure that our cell phone service for our border patrol in her district. So, Sergio, we're very pleased to have you and welcome. Thank you. It's uh, an honor to be here today to talk about getting the government back to work. Uh, I represent New Mexico's second congressional district, which has, is New Mexico is the state most affected by the government shutdown. And my district includes 178 miles of border. So I know how this is impacting people in my home. And the way it's impacting people is it's keeping hardworking parents from being able to get paid for the work they're doing protecting our borders. It's keeping other people who are supporting our vibrant tourism economy from being able to, uh, to even go to work, to be able to take out the trash that is piling up in these, uh, in these important tourism areas. So our shutdown is having, the shutdown is having real consequences in my district and in my home. It's also keeping us from talking about and finding real solutions to the things that matter. The things that I heard on the campaign, like health care, like having good jobs in the home that we love, like having real border security. Because real border security is strong, smart, and fair. The President last night spoke a great deal about uh, our, our problem with drugs coming into the country, which is wreaking havoc, which is wreaking a health crisis for people across the United States, and especially in rural places like the places that I represent. If he had talked about securing the places where the vast majority of those drugs are coming through, if he had talked about investing in our ports of entry, making sure that we have the technology to stop that drug flow and take on the cartel's main source of, uh, of, of money, he would have had no argument from me. Because I know we need real border security. I know that affects people who live along the border like the people that I represent. But that's not what we saw. So it's time that we get back to work. It's time that we start investing in real problem solving and we take on border security that is strong, smart, and fair. Let's have real border security. Thank you, and I'm so grateful to uh, turn the time back to uh, my distinguished colleague, uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. 
now you see why Sochi won an incredible <laughs> election. Uh, <coughs> let me also now yield to another one of our dynamic uh, members of the freshman class. And as I mentioned at the top, and as Sochi just mentioned, uh, we want to end this shutdown. We want to have a mature discussion about our broken immigration system, about border security, about comprehensive immigration reform moving forward at some point. Uh, but we are also going to continue uh, to make sure that we press forward with our For the People agenda focused on kitchen table, pocketbook issues, leading with health care, and to discuss what House Democrats will be doing on the floor later on today. Uh, let me now yield to the distinguished uh, gentleman from the great state of Texas, Colin Allred. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the House of Representatives is moving forward with the promises that we made to the American people despite uh, this shutdown. And beginning today, we will be placing the House of Representatives back on the side of the people uh, and defending the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I am a member of Congress uh, because of the issue of health care. And it's a personal issue to me. Uh, my mother is a breast cancer survivor. Uh, and there are so many stories and people uh, who approached me as I sought this office about our crisis with health care in this country. Uh, and the ruling that came out of a Texas court uh, in December in validating the Affordable Care Act has caused enormous anxiety uh, in my district and across the country. Uh, and today, uh, the House of Representatives will be voting uh, to defend the constitutionality of the ACA. And what does that mean? We'll be defending the health care of 133 million non-elderly Americans with pre-existing conditions who could lose their protections uh, if this lawsuit is successful. There are more than two million young adults who are able to stay on their parents' health care right now uh, that would lose that ability uh, if this lawsuit is successful. And there are more than uh, 100 million Americans who are now protected from lifetime limits on coverage uh, if this goes forward. And so I am proud to be leading this effort uh, with the support of my colleagues. I hope that this will be a bipartisan approach uh, to getting this done. I came to Congress to act on a bipartisan basis to form bipartisan coalitions, but also to stand up for our fundamental values. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act is now a pillar uh, of our system that Americans across the country are relying on and expect uh, to be in place. And I'm proud to be leading, leading the fight uh, to protect its constitutionality. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Of course, thank you, uh, Sochi. Thank you, Catherine. Questions? Well, I think we're all uh, supportive. The House Democratic Caucus uh, y is unanimous in supporting the notion that there are certain areas along the border where current uh, barriers exist, where the experts have said we can reinforce those barriers in a way that is consistent with border security. In my view, when Leader Pelosi talks about the, Speaker Pelosi talks about the immorality of the issue, she's talking about the entire dynamic as it relates to the xenophobic approach that some in this administration have taken to demonize immigrants, many of whom are currently in this country and are entirely uh, legal in terms of their presence, as well as others who are endeavoring uh, to make that difficult journey to present themselves lawfully at legal ports of entry in order uh, to petition for asylum consistent with the law and what the Trump administration is saying, we're going to keep those folks out as well. That's immoral. Uh, last week when you voted on some of these individual appropriations bills, you were successful in keeping off a handful of Republican senators. What's your assessment of the fact that you voted in tonight to start to vote on this individual bill? Do you think you'll have additional Republicans to vote this year? Yeah, we expect that uh, with each passing day, additional Republicans in the House as well as Senate Republicans will publicly express their objection to keeping our government shut down. As you indicated in the last week, we had about four or five uh, House Republicans join us. We expect that that number uh, will cross into double figures today uh, and as the week proceeds. Anything, Catherine? I, I just 
would add that we think that as this really hits home, as this first paycheck is going to be missed, um, we think that Republicans are starting to respond and understand that we need a comprehensive immigration reform. We need to have the discussion about national security, but not while holding um, our federal employees hostage. Last night, the president of a deal sense as a need for compromise, whereas your leadership said today continued to say no. How do the American people square what is the president saying that he's willing to move off of this demand and Democrats saying they are not? Doesn't it look like a refusal by House Democrats to give any level of compromise? Well, I think what House Democrats have said is that even though we're now in the majority and will have every right uh, to inject our own thoughts into these appropriations bills, we are willing to take what Senate Republicans have done in order to reopen the government so that we no longer are holding 800,000 federal workers hostage, as well as millions of Americans who rely on their federal government moving forward. That, to me, seems like a reasonable compromise. What we are saying is that we won't be blackmailed into uh, a discussion that finds us yielding billions of dollars for a border wall that no one believes will be effective outside of Donald Trump's narrow base. Let me also add to that point, within the last fiscal year, we allocated $1.3 billion in additional border security funding to the Department of Homeland Security. They have spent approximately 6% of that money. And at its core, what government is about is the management of public money. We can either manage that public money efficiently or we can waste taxpayer dollars. We are not going to waste taxpayer dollars. Can you respond to um, border security officials who say that the wall would be effective in their view in keeping back some of the administration in certain parts of the area? Do you believe that they're wrong or um, do you think that they have merit to what they're arguing? I think what we are saying is that we should have a reasonable discussion about uh, border security enhancements, but it should be done in a mature fashion outside of the context of a reckless government shutdown. And as somebody who represents uh, Texas, I just have to say that we do have physical barriers in place. I have visited them, I've seen them, and I think that they're appropriate in places. What we're talking about here is not wasting, as the chairman said, public money. But those border agencies saying in new targeted areas in addition to the established I think what we're seeing is that the folks who are um, the, on the other side, when they're talking about this uh, money that, that they're demanding, they haven't told us what they would do with it. So we don't know. And I don't think that you shut down the government over a single policy issue. This is what you're supposed to negotiate about. The government should be open. We're passing uh, bills today and last week to do that. And then we can discuss how we will effectively secure the border, but not in this way. Go back to the side of the room and then Thank you, just a question about broader Democratic priorities since the Congressman here is talking about the pre existing conditions in ACA. Uh, let's suppose the President does come to House Democrats and says, especially when you on House Judiciary, Mr. Jeffries, and say, hey, consider pulling some subpoena, pull some punches on subpoena investigation. I'll work with you. I'll work with you on something on pre existing conditions. Or he comes to you and he says, Hakeem, you know, Neptune Avenue and Coney Island needs a little bit of infrastructure work. Let's work together. Are you willing to pull some punches on that if it means being able to deliver some much needed wins to your own constituents? First of all, I appreciate the Coney Island reference. Uh, but uh, let, let me just say, and then I'll yield to Catherine Clark and Colin uh, if he would like. But we're going to move forward with our For the People agenda focused on kitchen table pocketbook issues because that's what we promised the American people. That's in the legislative bucket. We're also going to move forward with our oversight responsibilities as a separate and co-equal branch of government. We are not a wholly owned subsidiary of the Trump administration. And to some degree, what Americans voted for was a check and balance consistent with Article I of the United States Constitution. And so we are going to move forward with oversight that is fair, that is reasonable, that is anchored in trying to determine uh, whether the Trump administration is engaging in waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer dollars as well as some of the other issues around our democracy. And we can do both, and we should do both.
Yeah, uh, to give a concrete example, we heard in the midterms that the American people want Congress to function again, and they want to take the focus off of special interests and put it back on the challenges that they're facing. And just yesterday, we were able, after years of inaction, to put forward a comprehensive universal background check bill uh, for gun ownership. That is exactly what the American people want us to do. We are going to work every day to end this shutdown. But we are also going to continue with the agenda that the American people clearly told us that they wanted. And that includes health care, as Colin is helping us lead on that. That includes an infrastructure bill. That includes HR1 that is looking at corruption and making sure that we are protecting that fundamental right to vote. So we can walk and chew gum at the same time here. We are going to get this government open as soon as we can. But at the same time, this caucus is unified in proceeding on making sure that we are enacting that bold agenda the American people clearly told us in the midterms that they want. Final question? Uh, yeah, on, on the ACA vote, so given that the House voted in the last week already to authorize intervention in Washington, what's the point of doing it again outside of the aspect of you know, politically putting Republicans on track? Well, I think, again, we want to emphasize the singular importance of this effort. For many, the defining issue of the discussion that was held all across the country, as Colin has eloquently indicated in the last year, was we are either going to protect people with pre-existing conditions or you're going to take it away. We either are going to increase access to high quality affordable health care or we're going to take it away. And unfortunately, a singular judge in Texas has made the decision uh, to invalidate, if his ruling is allowed to stand, the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. That will devastate more than 100 million Americans and so this issue is so significant that we believe, outside of the context of the rules package, we want to give our colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, the opportunity to go on record and declare, do you stand with the American people as it relates to the Affordable Care Act and protecting people with pre-existing conditions, or do you stand with the special interests? So substantively, it doesn't really do much beyond the messaging aspect as far as you know, making a difference in the lawsuit. Let me again make the point that uh, as a standalone bill, there's an opportunity to demonstrate what we believe is growing bipartisan support. And in fact, you had folks like the new senator uh, from Florida and so many others campaign throughout the country on this issue. And we believe that it is important to send a message as a separate and co-equal branch of government, Article I of the Constitution, uh, where we stand, and that it's not necessarily, hopefully, uh, simply Democrats who want to protect affordable health care. And if you do it outside of the context of a rules package or other bills, you have that opportunity to project what we believe is bipartisan support. Thank you very much.